Get Growing with New Zealand Gardener is brought to you with support from Bunnings Warehouse. Hi there and welcome to the sixth and sadly final episode of Get Growing with New Zealand Gardener. I'm Jo McCarroll, I'm the editor of New Zealand Gardener and with me is Rachel Clare who edits our e-zine Get Growing. Hi Rachel, how Kia ora, are you? Jo. I'm very good, thank you. Sad that this is the last episode? I am sad, but you know, it's the end of the year, it's nearly Christmas, I love this time of year, I love all the pahutakawa and all the kanuka that are in blossom. It is, it's a spectacular time in the garden, everything's in bloom and in blossom and you just couldn't do more to make the world beautiful than the plants are doing right now. Yeah, and we get a holiday. And we get a holiday. And I am also hugely excited because Christmas has come early at Casa McCarroll and Ooh. I am putting in an irrigation system. Ooh, I'm jealous. Oh, I cannot tell you how excited I am. I mean, I've got this amazing irrigation system. It's drip line irrigation, so the water's going to be released right at the base of the plant. I've got this incredible gardena timer where I can release water different zones of my garden. I, I think I might. It's like NASA. That sounds amazing. So with the timer, do you operate it with your phone? I believe there is an app you can use. Honestly, it, and the idea We're was... We're in the future. I am in the future. <laughs> um, this is just going to be so incredible and I cannot wait for it. And the idea was, oh, we'll have this amazing irrigation system and then we'll be able to go away. But mm. it's too exciting to leave. You just have to stay you and You want to go outside things. and go, the garden's getting watered. Oh, yes. And what are you doing in your garden? Well, I have just experienced a Christmas miracle. About a month ago, I was weeding in the garden and my seven-year-old came out. He kind of decided to have a bit of a tantrum when he, where he leaned on top of me. And to my great annoyance, he caused me to squash my beautiful Christmas lily that was just coming into bud. What a sad, sad story. I was. Have you banished him? I was furious. Fair enough. And I talked about it for a long time. Even now? Yeah. Anyway, I was like, I'm just going to put it in a jar of water and leave it because I just can't put it in the compost yet because I've been watching it for months. This is the miraculous thing. It has bloomed. What a wonderful, wonderful story. There's a sad bit, there's a villain, which is your own child, Mm. but then there's a wonderful, wonderful outcome. Yeah, the spirit of Christmas and it smells amazing and maybe we don't really need that much dirt after all. Well, Rachel's not wrong. Christmas will be here soon. So it is a time of year when you can actually sow and plant really almost anything. You can sow beetroot and basil and beans. You can put in more broad beans, carrots, lettuces, radishes, spring onions, courgettes, cucumbers, spinach, silver beet. You can put in um, seedlings of melons, um, sweet corn in the northern regions. Um, And you can sow um, your brassicas for winter. So you've got great big seedlings when they go in. But you've got to really stop and ask yourself, How much do you want to sow and plant? Because if you're heading away, or even if you think you'll be just distracted by Christmas festivities, those newly planted seeds and seedlings have not really had a chance to establish, and they won't survive long if they dry out. And they can dry out really quickly, especially if it's windy. Um, So you can sow and plant, but before you do, take a really good long think about how much time you're going to be able to put into your garden over the next few weeks. Yeah, I take a bit of a break at this time of year when it comes to the edible garden. But something I have been doing is that I've been doing a lot of deadheading. So I've been doing that with my flowering annuals. So by deadheading them and cutting the heads off, and I'm not too fussy about it, I just go around with my secateurs. But by doing that, I'm tricking the plant into going, I haven't set any seed. I've got to keep making flowers. And that way I get a longer flowering season. Yeah, exactly. Because like all plants, all they really want to do is reproduce. So they want to set seed. So your rose for instance, if you leave the flowers on the plant, you don't deadhead them like Rachel's saying. They'll form what's called hips, but those hips are just seed pods. Um, And if you leave the flowers to dry on, say, your Um, dahlias, they'll dry off and they'll set seed as well. But you want to trick your plant and um, make it believe it hasn't sort of set up the next generation because then they'll keep putting all their energy into producing more flowers for you. And you just want to cut a rose just above the first growth bud, which is above a five-leaf branchlet. And I've got to say, this has been an amazing year for roses. I don't know how yours are looking, but mine are spectacular. Everyone who comes to the door says what beautiful roses. Now, something else that I'm going to be doing this weekend is I'm going to be planting some fruit trees that have been sitting around in pots for far too long. I'm not 
not even going to tell you. I'm really embarrassed. Rachel Claire. This is coming up in your performance review. I'm going to put water crystals in the hole when I plant them as well, just to try and keep them going, because you should water trees regularly when you've just planted them, particularly if you're planting them at this time of year. Anyway, if you're planting trees now, make sure you put in lots of manure, some fertiliser, make sure that your hole is at least twice the width and height of your root ball, add some water crystals and remember to keep watering and stake your tree as well. It's not a great time to plant, that's true, but then you're not wrong, Rachel, that if you've got plants sitting around in pots you picked up at the garden centre, you just couldn't resist them, try and get them in the ground because they're not going to survive long if you're leaving them in pots and you're not putting the care and attention into the watering. A pot life is not ideal. A pot life. It's no it's no life. Right, I don't want to alarm anyone, but Christmas is actually coming. And so that might mean you're thinking about uh, plants that relate to Christmas. And of course, the big plant that we all think about at Christmas is a Christmas tree. So I thought we'd have a chat to Ash Comera from Mount Gabriel Christmas Trees about Christmas trees, what sorts there are and how they grow. Hey, Ash, how are you? I'm good, thank you. So um, Christmas trees in New Zealand, what's the most common one? Uh, the mo- most common one is the, the radiator pine, which um, we Americans refer to them as being Monterey's, and it's kind of something that's stuck with the industry. So uh, definitely the standard pine, and I think that's because that's what people had. It was available um, years ago and cut down from the wild, and now we kind of cultivate them. And in other countries, they have really different traditional Christmas trees. Yeah, obviously, if you're living in northern England, then the Scots pine was the most popular one, and and southern was the Norwegian spruce. So what's available around the area is what becomes the traditional Christmas tree. Is there a reason why spruces haven't become the more popular Christmas tree in New Zealand? Um, Just because they're extremely hard to grow. They grow quite well on the South Island, but because it's spring... Um, they have a lot of very young, fine growth on them, and they just don't stand up well as a Christmas tree. So once they're cut, that new growth can really drop off and the tree can brown more quickly than you like? Uh, if it hasn't matured up, they go quite droopy and they never really recover no matter how much you try watering the tree. What does the Norwegian spruce look like, if people were imagining it? Um, they're quite straight branches and quite spiky looking. English people ask them and you, you say, you know, does it pop balloons? Does it draw blood if you grab it too hard? <laughs> and uh, does it drop needles all over the lounge floor that take months and months to vacuum out after Christmas? They go, yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's just what they're looking for. <laughs> they, they remember what mum and dad used to get when they're kids. That's the majority of English that are here that are after them. That's what they want. They remember that from Christmas years and years ago. And so what's the traditional Christmas tree in America, Ash? Um, the, the traditional tree is was the Douglas fir, but that's kind of changed now where I think the noble fir is probably the number one premium tree there. And what does that look like? The noble fir is probably similar to the popular tree um, in Europe now, which is a Nordman. It's quite a stocky needle-looking fir tree. Those Christmas traditions are so hardwired, aren't they? You think, this is what I grew up with, this is what I remember. So maybe we'll never really move on from the Pinus radiata in New Zealand because it's the tree we had as kids. Yeah, you might find that if people went to America to live from New Zealand, they'd probably hunt out a Monterey pine because that's, that's what they, they've always had as kids. So they wouldn't be that interested in Douglas Firs. That just smells like Christmas. Hey, thanks so much, Ash. Really appreciate you having a chat to us today. So today's Masterclass is on a subject very, very close to my green heart, and that is compost. Now compost is the end product you want to have left after a mix of organic material breaks down and it's the lifeblood of healthy soil and so of course healthy plants. Now organic material breaks down because of biological activity. So specifically I mean soil bacteria and fungi that eat and then excrete that organic matter and render it into this beautiful crumbly miracle product that plants can take up. If you want to make compost, think of it like making a cake. Um, Because if you want great results, you need to follow a basic recipe. Get the proportions right, mix them well, and give it time to cook. You only need four ingredients to make compost. Air, water, carbon, and nitrogen. Carbon comes from 
brown or dry materials. So that's straw and twigs and dry leaves and eggshells and coffee grounds and tea bags and the contents of your vacuum cleaner, um, even torn paper and cardboard. And nitrogen comes from wet or green materials. That's your grass clippings, your spent crops, your weeds, unless they're going to be viable or in seed, and any fruit and veggie scraps from your kitchen. So you need to combine those compost ingredients in roughly equal amounts. If you have too much green material or nitrogen-rich material, you'll get a stinky, slimy mess. And if you have too much dry material or carbon-rich material, the composting process just won't happen. Now, it's good practice to cut up most of what you compost because smaller items will break down much faster and that's because they have more surface area on which all those microorganisms can operate. Um, So shred twigs and paper and chop up your fruit and veggie scraps, maybe run your lawnmower over dried leaves, but leave in a few twigs and maybe the stems of your leguminous crops such as broad beans because that'll create little air pockets in the soil. They're nice and big and they'll just bring a bit of air in. And the bacteria that you want to have breaking all this organic matter down for you, they're living things and they need air in order to operate. Getting air in is also why you want to turn your compost heap with a fork. Every few months or so, mix some air in there and move what's on the outside into the centre and vice versa. And that'll bring air in and stop it getting all slimy and compacted. And those bacteria also need water, but not too much. If your compost is wringing wet rather than moist, then you'll get the anaerobic bacteria move in. So they don't need oxygen to operate, but they release, when they break this material down, a hydrogen sulfide as a byproduct. And hydrogen sulfide will be very familiar to anyone who's visited Rotorua. It's that sulfurous, slimy, rotten eggy kind of smell. So if you're visiting your compost heap and you suddenly start yearning for a hot pool, you're probably adding too much nitrogen-rich material, your green waste, your fruit and veggie scraps, your grass clippings, and not enough carbon-rich material, such as your cardboard and your newspaper and your fallen leaves and your twigs and your prunings. And without enough carbon, that green waste will compact down and the air gets squashed out. There's no air for your aerobic bacteria and the anaerobic bad guys move in. So you don't want your heap to be bone dry either because then there's not the water that your aerobic bacteria need. Um, So if it dries right out in the summer, um, maybe keep a lid on it if you've got it in a bin or put a piece of old carpet over a heap and just give it a squirt with your hose every now and again. Um, You don't want to add meat or fat or dairy to your compost. They all give off really putrid odours as they break down, and they also are likely to attract things like rats and blowflies. Um, So in general, just don't add any cooked food at all. Um, If you want to compost meat or dairy, you can do it at home using a bokashi system. Um, And don't put in any part of a perennial weed or any diseased plant material or glossy printed paper or cardboard or cat or dog poo, which can transmit diseases. You can, however, add uh, chicken or sheep or cattle or horse manure, but be aware that those animals spend most of their lives eating weeds and those weed seeds stay inside them and can be viable in your compost heap unless your compost heats up. If the good bacteria are working for you, they'll get really, really hot and compost heaps when they're working well can be hot enough to fry an egg on. In fact, people do use them to heat the water for their house or even cook. Um, So if your compost is working really well and nice and hot, you can pile on the poo because it's a really wonderful source of organic matter. Now, if you get it right, you should end up in just a few months with mature compost, which is dark and crumbly and it shouldn't smell at all. And that's going to be great for your garden and great for the planet too, because it's estimated that up to half of what goes into landfill could be composted. Um, And then you can use that compost in your garden and it'll improve your soil structure, it'll increase your water retention, it'll improve your drainage, it'll moderate soil temperature, it'll bring in worms, it'll release nutrients, and it'll suppress soil-borne diseases. And it'll pretty much do everything a gardener could desire apart from perhaps make you a gin and tonic at the end of the day. Our masterclass will help you grow something healthy with Bunnings Warehouse. So I'm going to have a chat to Andrew Grant, who's the National Green Life Buyer for Bunnings, about what to buy for gardeners for Christmas. Hi, Andrew. How are you? 
I'm good yourself. Good. Very well, thank you. Now, of course, Christmas is coming, and of course, everyone we know loves plants and loves gardening. So I thought it'd be interesting to know what you thought the really popular plants would be this Christmas. Well, I guess what's you know when you think about Christmas and you think about plants, what's more Christmas than poinsettias? You know, they're an awesome uh, red colour for Christmas, and you know they're going to light up any room. Mm, they're um, traditional. So they're a really great traditional gift for Christmas. Not very original though. I feel like they've no. ha- they've had their day. Uh, just to be harsh okay. to the poinsettia. So if you're looking for um, sort of plants that are on trend, or you know, or we're looking for a person that is um, likes their sort of decor items, and I like to call plants living decor items. Um, and people are always starting to create now urban jungles within their within their house. So you've got a, a really good trend at the moment is big foliage plants. And, you know, you've got some really nice plants like calatheas or different bark ears, um, alocasias. Monsteras are making a comeback. Monsteras um, so you've got are. plants like those that are um, a, a really big foliage and makes your house look really look like that urban jungle. Isn't it amazing that these plants that were like my grandmother used to grow, like string of pearls and hoyas, and now they're the hottest thing on Instagram? Oh, definitely. You know, you, you've got strings of everything at the moment, like strings of bananas, uh, string of dolphins, string of pearls. Anything that strings has string in the title is very popular. Um, yeah, as I say, hanging baskets are a really big trend as well. Like uh, you've got your scandapsis, like your pothos. Um, or your chain of hearts, like you've said, um, is, is really popular at the moment too. Wow. Honestly, I mean, it makes me think that all of these other vintage plants are going to come back and we should be immediately investing in African violets, perhaps. It's incredible now that these plants that are very old traditional plants, but they're going for hundreds of dollars on oh, trading sites. Yeah, well, you can see like a variegated uh, Monstera goes for thousands on Trade Me and is very much uh, one of the most uh, popular auctions on Trade Me. So, yeah, it's very interesting that these old school plants are coming back and um, it's great to see. And do you see anything, we were just talking earlier about how the great thing you want for Christmas is organic matter. Do you think people buy sheet pellets or compost? Is that too difficult to wrap? I think that would be too, and it might be a bit smelly left under the tree. Yeah, good point, Andrew, good point. (laughs) Maybe you just put a bow on the trailer. Bow on the trailer and leave it outside, yeah. (laughs) Um, And is there any other plants, any other traditional plants, like amaryllis or perhaps chrysanthemums? Yeah, definitely. You've got you know, your traditional gifts um, like, you know, chrysanthemums. They're like, you know, like giving a, a living bunch of flowers um, to the person. Uh, moth orchids, your phalaenopsis is the classic gift to anyone that likes receiving sort of flowers. Uh, hippy astrum bulbs and flowers, uh, you know, there's a great set of colours of pink, white and red these days. Um, you've always got the, you know, tried and true peace lilies or anthuriums. Um, and even kalinkoes are always bright and cheerful. It's such a great gift to plant because, of course, the person can have it. And like you say, it's like a bunch of flowers, but it can last so much longer. I mean, phalaenopsis can hold their flowers for months at a time. And um, then, you know, they'll come into flower again and you won't have to buy them something next year. Yeah, with a gift that keeps on giving. Excellent. Hey, thanks so much, Andrew. Really appreciate your time. No, thank you. From the journalists that brought you The Commune, Stuff presents True Story. Each episode, we're going to focus on just one yarn. Sometimes it'll be investigative, sometimes it'll be quirky, sometimes it'll be deep and meaningful. But always, always, it'll be about people and their voices. You're Eugene Bingham. And you're Adam Dudding. Yeah, yeah. It'll be a place for stories that don't necessarily fit elsewhere, but which we think need to be heard. Yeah. And they'll also be true. True story. True story. Out now and proudly brought to you by Disney+. Plus. Well, now we better answer our very last question of this Get Growing with New Zealand Gardener, but it's a very timely one, which is how can I keep my garden going if I'm heading away? How do I keep my garden growing over the holidays? Yeah, and that is a big issue, and I've been thinking about that for weeks and thinking about how I need to prepare because I don't want things I planted to die. And um, I will never forget the year that um, I left my flatmate watering 30 of my pot plants and they all died. I, I don't think she liked me very much. God, I hope you moved out. We just, we didn't talk for a while. (laughs) Um, So there are, of course, steps you can take. I am obviously very lucky with the irrigation system that the watering will be kept up. But watering is key. Big Christmas for you. It's going to be an amazing (laughs) Christmas. I can't tell you. Um, Watering is so key. So it's, it's great if you know or have someone that you can come and trust and talk them through your watering system. Um, But not all 
house sitters are created equal because not everyone understands watering, Rachel. Education is key if you want someone to look after your garden. They think waving a hose around for two minutes is enough. And of course, it takes a good hour and you have to have a glass of wine while you do it. Yeah, I my grandmother didn't train me to drink glasses of wine while watering, but she did train me to count to 100 while I watered each rose. Very, very good practice. But as well as keeping the water up, there are steps you should take now to make sure your plants suffer as little as possible in your absence or inattention. And of course, the most important of those is mulching. A really Mm. well-mulched garden can survive even up to a week. Yeah, and, if, water. and listen to episode five if you want to learn more about mulching. We love mulching, and we'll talk about it on every episode if we've got the chance. But mulching, um, if you've got plants in pots, um, shift them out of the direct sun and into a spot where they get maybe a morning or afternoon sun, so they're still getting some light, but they get shade during the hottest part of the day because, of course, the soil in pots will dry out even more quickly than the soil in the ground. And give them a real soak before you go, and give them a mulch too, especially if you've got smaller pots or black pots, because potting mix, if it dries right out, it's really easy to become high hydrophobic and then it's very, very hard to re-wet it again. This water just won't be held in that soil again. So um, pots and hanging baskets need watering every one or two days and one easy way you can take care of them while you're away is by getting a bottle, a plastic bottle, cutting the end off, upending it so the bit you drink out of is sticking into the soil and then filling that up with water and the soil will slowly absorb the water. Mm, I've tried that at home. I find the water isn't absorbed slowly though. I find it goes into the They're soil thirsty. quite quickly. Yeah. yeah. But I use the Oya pots, which are the terracotta pots and they're shaped kind of like um, a Greek amphora or maybe like for a modern reference, maybe a bit like Kim Kardashian. They're very fat on the bottom and very skinny at the top. So you bury those so the neck of the pot is flush with the soil and then you fill them with water and then it's a permeable terracotta. So that water is released. And with both of those techniques, it's a really good rule because the water's going into the soil and where the roots of the plants are and that's where the water should be. It shouldn't be sitting on the surface where you're going to lose heaps of it to evaporation. I gave um, all my family members who garden oil pots a couple of years ago and then didn't have one for myself. So maybe it's time to treat myself this year. Who knows? Maybe Santa will bring you an oil pot and a trailer full of compost. I hope so. And a retractable hose. And don't forget about your houseplants too. So there are a couple of things you can do with your houseplants. The simplest thing that I do is I just put them in big bowls of water. Now, normally we wouldn't advise this for general houseplant care, but this will be fine for a couple of days. Or if you've got a bath, um, you can line it with wet towels and water your plants well and then sit them in the bath. And use, again, a mulch on the top or even a thick layer of wet newspaper will just help keep the moisture in the pot itself. And it's quite easy if you've got plants that are too big to move to set up like a wicking system. You might have to look online, but it's pretty easy to do. You just need a bit of twine um, and that'll get the water into the the soil of a plant. If it's a big, big plant in the corner of a room, you don't want to be leaving it about the place. You just put, you can buy that sash cord for windows, can't you? And you put one end in a bucket of water and you put bury the other end about 20 centimetres or so down into your pot and then it draws the water out. That's so cool, isn't it? Yeah. You just have to make sure that the water source is higher than the pot. So gravity can help you out there. Yeah. So you and, put it on a stool or a brick or something. And it, in the outdoor garden, I just think it's amazing how gardens survive, actually. Um, it is, but you don't want to waste all the hard work you've put in already this spring. So take some action before it gets too crazy at the end of the year, and it will really pay off in spades when you come back in January and you can entertain everyone in your beautiful garden. <laughs> I have the privilege now of talking to my friend Margaret Barker, who as a very, very young bride in 1967 fell in love with a drafty and leaky castle on Otago Peninsula, which had been built by William Larnick in 1871. And around that castle, this great plantswoman has established one of New Zealand's most extraordinary gardens that's been recognised by New Zealand Gardens Trust as a garden of international significance and is a bucket list destination for gardeners all over the world. Hi, Margaret, how are you? Oh, good, thank you. Yes, it's a t- typical Dunedin day. It's been hot and now it's cold. A Dunedin spring. But can you tell me about your garden? What was there when you and Barry first uh, drove up to see the castle? Well, we found an overgrown, what had been, no doubt, a wonderland, but second growth was creeping up to the castle walls and 
The shelter belts are being planted too close to the building, but anyway, they had also self-sown. So there were macrocarpa trees and pine trees also ominous and looming, too close to the building. But you and Barry fell in love with it and bought it. Oh, yes, yes, we did. It was that um, general romantic aura about the place. And also we could see the quality of the stonework of the building and the carving and the wonderful woodwork within the building. But outside, also the framework and the footprint of what had been an old garden, which had slipped into decay. And how much did you know about gardening, Margaret, at that point? Well, my mother was a gardener, and in those days you visited gardens lots and lots, but really as a, an observer, not as a practitioner, because I wasn't much more than a university student. And what university students don't do, unless they're horticultural students, is garden. They think about well, you know what students think about. <laughs> it's not it's not about gardening. Not wholesome thoughts of plants. Um, I, I had to learn. I had to learn, although there was the background of seeing gardens and growing up in large gardens and playing in large gardens and um, making mud pies and, and waterways in large vegetable gardens. And in the gardens at the castle, what was the, the first area that you and Barry started work on? Uh, well, what we first purchased was 35 acres, but a lot of it and never explored till a few years down the track because we were busy in the middle of the middle and just trying to deal with that for a long time. Of course, you had your two little children too and water coming yes, through the yes, roof. Yes, had two little children. And we took, we took the shelter belts for granted because there were shelter belts right around until a big storm in 1976 when we lost several hundred trees. I mean, never mind, people in Canterbury lost several thousand trees, but then we suddenly realised that trees weren't there forever. Trees are just there until they, like all other life forms, including ourselves, have finite lifespans. And then you uncovered the original rock garden. Is that right, Margaret? Uh, yes, yes. Well, we didn't know it existed until we were told about it by um, the person who had actually laid it out in 1927. So it was literally engulfed by second growth, including uh, yew trees and sycamore trees, of course, terrible weed here, and holly, as well as blackberry, and it was actually several years clearing back, but it wasn't the first thing that we were doing. But if there was spare time, my husband would go back, you know, and he felt like bashing something back because it was fun to go exploring and discover that. And, of course, you discovered some of those original plants that were still growing. Yes, a, a very few, a very few. The double double white anemone came up, anemone nemorosa festal, and also Jack and the Green Primroses. But the exciting thing for me was the little double true snowdrop, Galanthus, and they came up, having been buried for more than 30 years, which I thought was a sort of a miracle, which, of course, nature is a miracle, but these, these bulbs came up, and I'd never seen snowdrops before because they came from uh, Napier in the North Island where it's too warm for them to grow. So that was exciting. Yes, a few plants did reappear. Very brave plant. <laughs> and then I know you've told me that you went off to Scotland and you discovered New Zealand plants there. Oh, well, yes. It gave me a new, a new view of New Zealand because you tend to think that overseas they garden better. But New Zealanders, of course garden wonderfully well and they do garden well and I suppose our gardening is a, um, the European heritage or a lot of it but here we have our own heritage of our native plants and I think you have to go away and come back to appreciate that and perhaps it needs to be pointed out to you as well but you come back with the fresh eye and see your own country and your own plants so we interpret 
the perhaps European um, tradition, but in our own way. So when you returned, you were taking out some of those exotics and putting in a whole range of natives, some of which I'm amazed you've managed to grow in Otago. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, we took out actually ageing North American conifers. I always apologise to the North Americans when I say that. But anyway, yes, and put in our own um, temperate rainforest plants, which, of course, the natural forest in the area that um, where I now garden, it was a temperate rainforest. So putting back what was there, but me being me and an inveterate collector, all sorts of things have crept in. But we've got Dracophyllum traversii and six different uh, tree ferns and other ferns which you think you wouldn't perhaps grow in Dunedin, like the um, the king fern and kidney ferns and so on. So a wonderful collection of ferns, which, of course, define um, the damper parts of New Zealand. And are they? how do they perform at your altitude, of course, Margaret? Uh, I think the altitude, we're just a little bit cooler and and got more humidity, so the ferns love that. And, of course, the rainforest plants love that too. Yes, just a bit cooler. Now, I know you travel a great deal and you take in so much from these botanising trips all over the world about how plants will perform best in the conditions where they originate. And I really have taken that on board from you over the years, that if you can see plants growing in their natural environment, it means you can have so much more success growing them in your garden. Yes, that, that is right, because you un- understand the plant and its requirements. And also the other thing is I found when I came here, we couldn't grow deciduous trees because I had these visions of wonderful autumn colour. And it actually took me 10 years to find out what I couldn't grow. And I had 10 years of acute disappointments. So now I don't even just, I know that certain plants I can't grow, but I also know I can't grow successfully other plants from those regions. So now it's not just the this plant grow or that plant grow. Now I think about the environment they come from and is that environment similar to our environment before I think about whether or not I'll try it. So now I get a lot less um, a lot less disappointments. But having come from a completely different climate, the Mediterranean climate of Napier, I, I, it did take me quite a few years to get my head around the um, climate, at, at the specific climate at the castle. But everybody has that if they move from one, one area to another. And it is all just a learning process, which is what gardening is a lifetime's learning process. That is so absolutely true. I mean, you've been gardening at Larnet Castle for more than 50 years now, and yet the garden continues to change and develop. Yes, well, I'm still learning, and that's the wonderful thing about gardening is because you are learning all the time, and learning, learning keeps your mind young, and the exercise keeps your body young. So what can be better than gardening? Couldn't agree more. It's an anti anti aging. It's an anti aging activity. It's an anti aging activity, and you're not paying two hundred dollars for a jar of it to keep in your bathroom. Thank you so much, Margaret. I really appreciate your time. Wherever your garden grows, grow something with Bunnings. So we're just going to kill off one more mysterious death in this podcast. And I think we should do something a bit Christmassy, like a Christmas murder. I'm guessing that you're talking about poinsettia. Poinsettia, because honestly, I hear from so many readers who say, you know, how can I keep this poinsettia going? And how can I get my poinsettia to bloom again for me in the following year? And you know what I say to them, Rachel? What do you say? Let it die. Yeah. I just don't like them. They're garish. Yeah, I I agree. I don't like them either. I think they're like those garish Christmas t-shirts. You might as well have novelty flashing earrings. I mean, and also they're not even real flowers. You know, the bright red Mm. is sort of like the upper leaves. It's the bracts. The flowers are the tiny, tiny little inconspicuous in the middle of all those red leaves. And in order to get them red, because of course they're a Northern Hemisphere Mm. tradition, they've been basically tortured. I mean, they're kept in the dark to fool them into thinking it's winter and they'll produce their red foliage. And then people bring them home and of course you 
bring them into the New Zealand summer, and that's one of the reasons why they so often die. But the other, of course, is they're absolute pains. They need just exactly the right conditions to survive. Yeah, I actually read a description when I was answering a question about them once where someone said, don't worry if you can't get it to flower. It's a tedious process that requires a lot of care and patience. And then they provided a calendar of poinsettia care month by month. Oh, who has time, especially at this time of the year? And unfortunately... We've run out of time. Forget growing with New Zealand Gardener. Uh, We hope you've really enjoyed the podcast. We've loved making it for you and talking to so many amazing gardeners and plants people all over this incredible nation of gardeners. Uh, Have a wonderful Christmas and a happy and safe New Year. Enjoy your beautiful garden in this amazing and beautiful country. Thanks so much. Happy Christmas. From the journalists that brought you the commune, staff presents... True story. Each episode, we're going to focus on just one yarn. Sometimes it'll be investigative, sometimes it'll be quirky, sometimes it'll be deep and meaningful, but always, always, it'll be about people and their voices. You're Eugene Bingham. And you're Adam Dudding. Yeah, yeah. It'll be a place for stories that don't necessarily fit elsewhere, but which we think need to be heard. Yeah. And they'll also be true. True story. True story. Out now and proudly brought to you by Disney Plus.